you're talking to a largely libertarian audience and on libertarian social media this week, there's been various clips of Ron Paul circulating around. And I wanted to play one of those to open up that conversation about what the U.S. role in Israel and Palestine has been and should be moving forward. So let's roll that clip of Ron Paul from 2001 voting against a um, a, a sort of Re, uh, voting against a resolution that would have condemned uh, a Palestinian bombing of Israel at the time. Uh, and he was the sole Republican to vote against that. And this was the speech he gave in support of his vote. So let's roll that. We here today talk about being having solidarity with Israel. And others get up and, and try in their best way to defend the Palestinians and, and the Arabs. So it's sort of a contest. Should we be pro-Israel or pro-Arab or anti-Israel or anti-Arab and how do we, how are we seen in doing this? And it's pretty important, but I think there's a third option to this that we so often forget about. Why, why can't we be pro-American? What is in the best interest of the United States? We haven't even heard that yet. I believe that it's in the best interest of the United States not to get into a fight, a fight that we don't have the wisdom to figure out. Now, I would like to have neutrality. That's been the tradition uh, uh, for America at least a century ago, to be friends with everybody, trade with everybody, and to be neutral unless somebody declares war against us, but not, not to demand that we pick sides. Now, I have a proposal and a suggestion, which I think fits the American tradition, that we should treat both sides equally, but in a different way. Today, we treat both sides equally by giving both sides money and telling them what to do. Not a million dollars here or there, not a hundred million here or there, but tens of billions of dollars over decades, always trying to buy peace. And my argument is that it generally doesn't work, that there are unintended consequences. These things backfire, they come back to haunt us. So I think we should start off by defunding, defunding both sides. I, I'm just not for giving all this money. Because every time there are civilians killed on the Israeli side or civilians killed on the Palestinian side, you can be assured that either our money was used directly or indirectly to do that killing. So we are, in a way, an accomplice on all this because we fund both sides. The policy of foreign non-intervention, where the United States is not the bully and doesn't come in and tell everybody exactly what to do and put these demands on. If we didn't do that, yes, we could, we could have some moral authority to come condemn violence, but should we not condemn violence equally? Could it be true that only innocent civilians have died on one side and not the other? I don't believe that to be true. I believe that it happens on both sides, and on both sides, they use our money to do this. I urge a no vote on this resolution. What do you think of Ron Paul's idea that America would be better off, and actually so would Israel and Palestine, if the U.S. just cut off aid altogether uh, to both sides? What I would say is, probably not directly answer that, but I would say that so far, I think that the Biden response has been good. Mm -hmm. I think that the attack was just appalling. And I think that the administration, unlike honestly, a lot of people around the world have recognized how horrible the violence was. Mm -hmm. The United States, to the best of my understanding, has told Israel that it will support it with the Iron Dome, that it that basically you need to replenish the stocks, and it's very expensive because its adversaries have so many of these, these rockets, and that the United States will provide assistance which is defensive assistance in that area. And that I also support 
I was surprised to see this, but such a swift, a swift dispatch um, to the Eastern Mediterranean as a deterrent. Again, I think that that's strategic. And although the Pauls might disagree and think that that's too much American involvement, um, it comes at very low cost for the United States and mm -hmm. could actually save money and prevent future incentives, which could increase the risk of embroiling the United States more um, in a wider Middle East conflict. So in my mind, those are the three main responses of the Biden administration. It's been rhetorical. It's been for defensive um, weaponry, especially with the Iron Dome. And then also moving the ship closer to um, Hezbollah uh, to warn Hezbollah and Iran. And I believe that U.S. diplomats have been in touch um, with both of those international actors, telling them, warning them that the United States could um, get involved. So thus far, from what I've seen, um, I have uh, approval. And I'm not sure that um, the Biden administration's response has necessarily rankled um, those who are sympathetic to a more libertarian approach to foreign policy. Yeah, I but totally what about this? Point that, what about this point that um, that sort of pouring money into the region over the years, ha with, under this pretense that you know it's going to get in the right hands and it's going to be used in a way that advances U.S. interests in the region, that it just hasn't worked out that way. Um, you know, there's been since it's inception about a quarter of a trillion dollars gone into israel several tens of billions to palestine about half a billion to palestine since uh, the biden administration took power and you know we don't know how that money has been used presumably at least some of it has been used to obtain rockets or weapon other weapons to go into israel um i mean I know we're in the midst of a fight right now that it's it's hard to it might be hard to think about these questions but going forward is that something that needs to be rethought the amount of aid that's the US aid and weapons going into the region I mean I want to provide a little bit of context here and that is when it came to the origins of you know in Israeli state and US levels of support for Israel, the US ended up supporting um, Israel, not for strategic reasons, for humanitarian reasons in the aftermath of the Holocaust, as well as domestic political reasons, because of course, you know, some prominent American Jews were very much in favor of Truman recognizing Israel. U.S. support for Israel stayed relatively low until after the Six-Day War. It wasn't immediate, but after that, there was the so-called War of Attrition around 1970. And at that point, really shown in the Six-Day War, but it took a, little, a couple of years, you can see a major, major uptick in U.S. military support for Israel. And all of a sudden, Israel was seen as um, not just worthy of support for domestic reasons or humanitarian reasons, but as a strategic ally in the context of the Cold War. And Israel did, Israel was useful strategically to the United States in the Cold War as the main U.S. proxy in the Middle East. You know, the Soviets had them on their side and, and the U.S. had Israel on its side. When the Cold War ended, the case for Israel um, became harder to make for, for, for groups like APAC because they had been used to selling Israel as a strategic asset in the context of the Cold War. And then what made it even tougher was, you know, a decade, a little more than a decade after the Cold War ended, you had the 9-11 the attacks where Osama bin Laden, you know, listed a whole lot of reasons 
for why he attacked us, but one of them um, was essentially uh, U.S. relations um, with Israel. And so increasingly, it seemed that American citizens were wondering, well, you know, what do we get out of this deal? Not only is Israel no longer a strategic asset, but it might even be a liability. The, one of the reasons why I think that the U.S. has had such a strong relationship with Israel beyond the typical causal explanations, you know, domestic American support, um, uh, sympathy, shared values, et cetera, all that, is something really simple. And that is that, in general, Israel has shared very similar enemies as the United States. And so when, the, when, 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 when D.C. thinks of who its enemies are, they're often really similar to the enemies which are shared um, in, in Jerusalem. And we see that working with respect to U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia, you, the te, you know, terrible relations um, with Iran. Um, and I think that there's a lot of sort of emotional value which translates into support, at least at the policy level, um, by having a lot of the same mutual enemies. And, and a lot of the enemies actually make it easy because they'll actually say death to Israel, death to America. And it creates a, a very sort of easy opening for people like Lindsey Graham to say, not only do we have shared enemies, but we therefore have, you know, shared interests in that essentially, like Nikki Haley might suggest, an attack on Israel is, is it, you know, is an attack on America. Um, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of context to listeners in terms of how we got to this point in terms of the trajectory of U.S. support for Israel. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Max Abrams about Hamas's attack on Israel. For another clip, click here. For the full conversation, click here.